Hello, everyone. This is Alice. I'm so glad to meet you this time on I Can Act Talks. First of all, I want to say Happy New Year. This was a New Year, the first week of I Can Act Talks. We are so happy to have all of you back to this stage. I think in 2020, yeah, we have a lot of things to share on I Can Act Talks. We have about 100, you know, scientists from the whole world share the latest results and share lovely, you know, achievements on this stage. And uh, we have about 10 million, you know, uh, uh, audience join this show. So we continue this wonderful journey. And this was the first week of I Can Act Talks in 2021. So what are we going to have? The first uh, group of speakers was come out. They from Australia and China and the US and uh, uh, everywhere in, uh, in the whole world. So first, let me introduce the speakers. This week, we're going to have a Professor Jack Dish from Australia. And uh, we're going to have a uh, 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 Ting Zhang was from China, Suzhou, and uh, both of them will talk about the uh, highlight for flexible electronics. One is for optical electronics, another is for electronics. So we put the title as flexible optical electronics, and uh, this will be a nice speaker for lighting the whole the world by electronics and using flexible material and flexible devices. And uh, we have. Our Paul Vish, Professor Paul Vish from UCLA, has joined us to host these sessions. And uh, me, Alice Zhang, yeah, was here to host the sessions too. So this will be a very nice weekend, and we will have a very enjoyable uh, talks and discussions. First, uh, let's welcome the first speaker, Professor Jack Dish. Uh, Professor Jack Dish is one of the world famous scientists, you know, worldwide, the most famous one. He's from Australian National University. Uh, he does a lot of work, not only covers the talks for, you know, optical uh, electronics, he covers from, uh, you know, semiconductor, nanowares, opticals, and many, many, many things. And uh, he have uh, more than Hundred or thousand, you know, papers, and I have a more a many many nursing many many students in the whole world. Now today he is going to talk this fantastic talk for semiconductor nanowire for optical electronics applications. This was a hot topic, and this was the latest results from Professor Jackdish. So Professor Jackdish, stage is yours. Word is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Alice, and uh, for uh, that kind introduction. And uh, so, good morning, at, uh, good afternoon, or uh, good evening, depending on where you are. And uh, thank you for joining us. And also, I also want to take this opportunity to wish all of you Happy New Year. And uh, also, Happy Chinese Upcoming New Year, Ox Year, this year. And then hope uh, you get uh, good health and good happiness and uh, good wealth as well for the new year. So really, uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about semiconductor nanowires for optical electronics applications. And as Alice mentioned, that I'm from the Australian National University in Canberra, Australia. But I also have the honorary appointments in India, Japan, China, UK. So it's a really a pleasure to work with uh, my colleagues in various parts of the world. And uh, so it's, it's been really wonderful to work with my colleagues. So before I proceed further, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. And there are many groups in, uh, uh, there's a joint effort between my group at the Australian National University, many groups in Australia, US, UK, China, Sweden, Russia, Italy, Russia, and Switzerland. So really it's a beauty of science is that there are no national boundaries, we can all work together. And it's been a real pleasure for me to working with my colleagues in various parts of the world. And I also want to thank many students and postdocs in working in these groups because I've only listed the professors, those who are involved in this research, but uh, many students and postdocs in these groups are also involved. I want to thank all of them. And uh, without their contribution, there is nothing much to talk about. This is my group at the Australian National University. And uh, so really, these are the bright young people and it's a really pleasure to work with, with them for me. And uh, typically we have about 10 to 12 nationalities at any one time. And uh, really I enjoy working with them because they're always uh, enthusiastic and energetic and really doing enthusiastic research. 
And I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge your funding agencies for the support which they provide and uh, allowing us to be able to do exciting science. So here is the overview of my talk. I'll give you the motivation why we're interested in nanowires. And then I'll talk about how do we grow the nanowires and nanostructures. And then I'll give you examples of nanowire lasers and LEDs, nanowire terahertz detectors, nanowires for solar cells, and also using nanowires for photoelectrochemical water splitting and using nanowires for neuron growth and I'll draw some conclusions. And before I proceed further, I would like to acknowledge many groups. Those are working in the field of nanowires in various parts of the world. And in science, we learn from each other and we build on each other's work. And really, I, it's important in science to really acknowledge our colleagues, those are really working in our fields, in our areas of research which we are working on, without which we'll be poorer in terms of being able to make, uh, improve the knowledge in the field which you are working on. Before I proceed further, and then I let me introduce you to the various industrial revolutions. And uh, so as you know, that uh, first industrial revolution has started with the steam power and mechanization. Second industrial revolution started with the electrical power and mass production. Third industrial revolution started with computer power and automation. But now we are moving towards the fourth industrial revolution. So really in the area of fourth industrial revolution, people are predicting that the digital world and biological world will be coming together and then you will have human machine interactions and light is the one which is really going to play an important role to sense and interface humans and machines in view of the fact that 90% of our information is obtained by light. So typically at the moment, light-based industries are about 1 trillion Australian dollars. And then we are predicting that people are predicting that by 2030, and this is going to be double that of what the currently current market is. So the World Economic Forum in 2018 has identified some future technologies. And then these technologies include holographic displays and potentially in the future, you could potentially have the holographic images coming out of your telephone, for example, smartphone, for example, so that you'll be able to interact with people much more uh, interactively and also wearable optical sensors and light navigation, LIDAR and other uh, light-based communications uh, with the surrounding cars, so thereby you can have the autonomous vehicles, and also 3D vision and gesture recognition, enhanced machine vision, and augmented reality. And all these technologies will be fundamentally requiring fundamentally new approaches for smart miniaturized optical systems. So as part of our center of excellence uh, on the uh, meta-optical systems, transformative meta-optical systems, funded by the Australian Research Council, and uh, we are working on generating nanoscale light sources, generating light and manipulating light using metal surfaces and detecting light using again nanostructures and then really to be able to develop the newer technologies which are smaller and smarter and uh, so then also lighter and are also faster and also consume less energy. So that's our aim, this aim of this particular center which has been funded for about seven years and then led by Professor Dragomir Neshe, my colleague at the AANU. There are about five universities are involved in the center of excellence with about 15 CIs contributing with bringing different aspects of the expertise and also many more in many international partners are also participating in the center of excellence. And in fact, we are looking for uh, uh, PhD students and postdoctoral fellows in work, to be working in this area of uh, uh, meta-optic systems. And if you're interested in any of the positions, please keep an eye on this website. And in uh, late January or early February also, we're going to advertise these positions. Optoelectronics, what is optoelectronics? We all know about electronics. And uh, so the, whenever we're using our computers or any smart devices, and then we're using electronics based out of silicon. Silicon is a workhorse for the microelectronics and nanoelectronics industry. But unfortunately, silicon is not a very good light emitter because it's an indirect band gap semiconductor. You need to have a direct band gap semiconductors in order to get a good light emission. And that's where compound semiconductors come into picture, like gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, gallium nitride, gallium antimonide, and a combination of these materials. And these materials have got different band gaps, the energy difference between the valence band and the conduction band. And then that means they emit different colors of light, for example. So really, the development of the nitride technology has led to uh, developed by the Japanese scientists, Dr. Samano, Dr. Nakasaki, and Dr. Nakamura, 
It led to the Nobel Prize in 2014 for physics for, for the development of the blue LED. Till that point, we had a red LED and green LED, and the third missing color is a blue LED, primary color is a blue LED, but in view of the development of these materials, now we're able to really have the white LEDs, and in fact, the solid state lighting has led to significant developments, for example, large area displays. In fact, this is in the Times Square in New York City, and where even the bright daylight, you're able to watch the TV and other things because of the fact that these LEDs are very, very efficient, for example, high brightness LEDs. But also solid state lighting is playing an important role where we're consuming less energy. And again, that helps you in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions or so. And also that lasers have been also been developed using these materials and covering a broad spectrum from the infrared region to visible region to UV region of the, infrared, the electromagnetic spectrum or so. But also the same materials could also be used for photo detectors where infrared detectors, for example, you can use it for biomedical imaging applications or for night vision applications or so. And even in manufacturing, where, for example, in a computer chip, while you're running that one, if you want to see where the heat is generated, by taking an infrared image, you'll be able to identify the heat is generated. Heat removal from the electronic circuits is a major challenge. And again, infrared imaging is really helping us to be able to do that one, allowing the chip designers to be able to redistribute the devices so that you can minimize the hotspots in these electronic devices, for example. But also these semiconductors, uh, three five semiconductors are leading to solar cells, which are the most efficient solar cells in the world today with exceeding 47% or so now using the something called as a you know, multi-junction solar cells, which are absorbing the different parts of the solar spectrum. These solar cells are very expensive. They've been developed for the satellite communications, uh, satellite applications, but satellites are expensive. Obviously you want to have the most efficient solar cells but now since the efficiencies have gone beyond 40% or so, people are exploring how we can use in the terrestrial applications, for example. But for example, here's a concentrated photovoltaic system and where the sunlight has been concentrated to this focal point here, I talked about 500 suns or 1000 suns or so. And you have the fact that the system cost is so high, people want to have the most efficient solar cells and that's where again, three five semiconductor solar cells have been explored for this purpose. But again, in optical fiber communications, again, now if I'm able to talk to you today is from Australia, where the electrical signals from my computer have been trans uh, transformed into optical signals by using lasers. And then their lasers are switched on and off and sending to the optical fiber. And on the other end, these optical signals are converted back into the, the electrical signals by using photo detectors. And particularly these material, these optical systems are really operating in the infrared region of the spectrum of 1.3, 1.55 micron window region, that's where the optical fibers have got the lowest absorption and dispersion. And then again, indium gallium oxide phosphide material system is been used for to be able to make the lasers and photo detectors operating in this wavelength system or so. As you can see that the three five semiconductors play an important role in the case of optoelectronics. In optoelectronics is conversion of electricity into light like lasers and LEDs our conversion of light into electricity in the case of solar cells and photodetectors, for example. So that's why we call it as optoelectronics. So nanowires. Nanowires are seen as building blocks for the next generation electronics and photonics. So really one of the unique things with the nanowires is the lattice mismatches are no longer an issue. So whenever you are depositing two dimensional materials, you always have to worry about what is the lattice constant. Lattice constant in the unit cell of the crystal which repeats itself in the crystal, for example. So the lattice mismatch is too large and the crystal layers uh, revert back to their own original lattice constant. In the process, they create a lot of dislocations and defects and then these materials are useless as far as optical electronic devices are concerned. But whereas in the case of nanowires, it turns out that uh, in principle, that if a material has got a large lattice constant with respect to the substrate, it can expand without creating dislocations because of its nanoscale and three-dimensional architecture. But also if a material which has got a smaller lattice constant with respect to the substrate, it can contract without creating dislocations. So that means you'll be able to really make you grow the nanowires of any material on any substrate without the constraints of lattice mismatch. People have been dreaming of integrating three five semiconductors of silicon to bring the optoelectronics and electronics together but the lattice mismatch has been a major challenge. But now we and other many groups are working on 
growing these nanowires and silicon substrates, we will be able to integrate both electronics and optoelectronics. But also in the case of nanowires, you can create something called axial heterostructures. So these green materials are different than the red material. So that means you can put a different materials within the nanowire, giving you new functionality, for example. Well, the actual quantum wells, which we can create, which I can come back and then tell you. But also in these nanowires, we can dope these things n-type and p-type. So thereby you can make a p-n junction. So mostly if you want to make an LED or a laser or a solar cell or a photo detector, you need to make p-n junctions. And then within the nanowire, we'll be able to do that one so that we can make a single nanowire LEDs and lasers and detectors and solar cells or so. And then also you can create a radial heterostructures. This red material is different than the pink material. So in fact, you can create a multi-shell narrow, nano wires and other things. And again, me and many other groups have been really exploring these ones. You can also create a branch nano wires, which really provides you three-dimensional architectures, which you are able to really create here. In fact, many examples which are from my own laboratory, where we're able to show that the gallium antimonide nano wires can be grown on gallium arsenide, despite the large lattice mismatch, we were able to show that we can really go, grow atomically perfect gallium antimonide on top of gallium arsenide. And this is the work of Dr. Chiang Gao. And uh, the indium arsenide nanowire branches can be grown on gallium arsenide. So that means they could be used as cantilevers and scanning probes and wide variety of terse applications or so. In the case, also we can make indium phosphide nano trees. And then these trees are absorbing different parts of the solar spectrum. So thereby you're harvesting the solar spectrum much better. For example, for splitting of water to generate hydrogen. And most recently, we are moving from nano wires to nano membranes as well, so that we can explore a wide variety of other ways of making the nano structures and see their functionality. Most importantly, International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, the, these are the people, those who identify what technologies are needed for the next generation electronics. They've identified nanowires as a key, key technology component for the next generation electronics as well. And most importantly, now the lattice mismatch is no longer an issue. People want to grow 3-5 semiconductor nanowires on silicon. So thereby you can make a faster transistors because 3-5 semiconductors have got a higher electron mobility than silicon. So that means if you want to make faster transistors, 3-5 semiconductors are very valuable or, uh, and can do a great job. And again, IBM, in Zurich and then and Intel and others have got a major research programs. And most recently, IBM constated indium gallium arsenide nanowires and silicon transistors, and they've shown excellent performance from these ones. So it really opens up a lot of opportunities for us. So if the nanowires are so much of importance, how do we make these nanowires? There are two main techniques which we use. And uh, the one technique is called a metal catalyzed vapor liquid solid growth mechanism, VLS growth process. Another technique is called selective epitaxy. And the, one of the techniques which we use called a metal organic chemical vapor deposition, MOCVD. There's an alternative technique called a molecular beam epitaxy. You can use that one as well. Depending on what machines you are available, you can choose whichever the technique which you want to use. So in the case of this VLS growth process, we put some metal nanoparticles like gold, for example. You can buy this colloidal gold solution from five nanometers up to 300 nanometers because they're used for biological tagging applications, for example. So you can put a droplet of this colloidal solution. Typically, we use about 30 or 50 nanometer colloidal solution. In this case, we're using 50 nanometers here. So though the melting temperature of gold is about more than 1,000 degrees Celsius, but once gold reacts with the gallium or aluminum or indium, this alloy, gold gallium or gold aluminum or gold indium, has got a melting temperature as small as 350 degrees Celsius. So now, if I put this gold nanoparticle on top of gallium arsenide substrate, for example, put that unit in the MOCVD reactor, heat it up to somewhere between 370 to 500 degrees Celsius, and then essentially what you're creating is a gold gallium alloy here, and then introduce the gases needed for the growth of gallium arsenide, trimethyl gallium and arsine, and these gases get incorporated into this liquid alloy, it gets supersaturated, and then the crystals start precipitating out, gold is always sitting on the top. It is like, uh, you know, if you put more and more sugar into water, and then initially the sugar starts dissolving, and above the solubility limit, what happens? So the sugar crystals start precipitating out. Essentially, the same physics is happening here. This is the work of my former student, Dr. Hannah Joyce, 
who is not a reader, an associate professor in University of Cambridge. And then about 13, 14 years back or so, she has demonstrated by developing a new technique called a two temperature growth process, where she was able to demonstrate excellent galibasana in wise with no tapering and also no defects whatsoever. There's a scanning electron microscope image, there's a transmission on electron microscope image. You can see the gold nanoparticle sitting on the top here, and here is a galimasna narrow wise, and with no twin defects or anything which has been a problem till that point or so. So really, this work really, uh, really excited people uh, globally and uh, how to get rid of defects and you'll be able to really get atomically perfect nanowires or so. And uh, so we have also used selective epitaxy. In this case, we don't use any metal nanoparticles and we take a, a, a semiconductor substrate. In this case, I'm giving an example of indium phosphide. And then we put some silicon dioxide deposition by PECVD, plasma has chemical for deposition and then put some photoresist and do electron lithography and then really create patterns of holes, for example. And then you transfer these holes through the silicon dioxide so that indium phosphide is exposed in these holes here. Then we put this one into the emulsivity reactor and then introduces the gases needed for the indium phosphide growth of trimethyl indium and phosphine at these temperatures and uh, these gases dissociate, indium phosphide narrow wire starts growing here. This is the work of Dr. Chian Gao. And then she is uh, uh, now a research engineer in Blue Glass in Sydney. And then she was able to show that after spending a lot of time in optimizing growth conditions, you can get atomically perfect indium phosphide narrow wires. And again, ordered patterns because you created ordered patterns of holes here. You can see the top view shows a beautiful hexagonal facets or so. And these are about 200 nanometers in diameter. So we can make, in this case, we can make nanowise as small as 70 nanometers up to 700 nanometers or so. But in this case, we can make nanowise as small as 20 nanometers up to 300 nanometers or so. But you can see that sure, in this case, you know, because we're putting a droplet of gold and these droplets are randomly distributed, that's why these nanowise are located randomly. We can also create ordered patterns of gold. We can also create ordered patterns of these nanowise using this process as well. And you can choose whichever the process which you prefer to do these ones. And we've gone off and taken these indium phosphide nanowires and looked at the light emission from these structures. We take these nanowires and excite them with the laser pulse and look at the light coming out of this one, the so-called photoluminescence. So you can see the quantum efficiency of these indium phosphide nanowires as a function of the excitation power density. And then the quantum efficiency is up to 50% can be achieved using these indium phosphide nanowires. And we are also comparing these ones with indium phosphide epitaxial layers, two-dimensional layers, which are grown under optimum conditions and the blue curve. Now you can see that they're very much comparable, indicating that despite large surface area of indium phosphide nanowires, you see very little uh, uh, difference in terms of quantum efficiency or so, indicating that the surfaces really do not, the surface recombination is not too high in the case of indium phosphide. In fact, we measured that one or so indicating that these indium phosphide nanowires are excellent as far as uh, uh, the uh, lasers and uh, uh, solar cells and other devices are concerned. Also, Dr. Aruni Ponseka uh, has contributed this indium phosphide nanowire growth as well, who is now a research associate at the University of Paul. So now let me move from nanowires to other structures. We have spent a lot of time in growing wide variety of nanowires, but I'll not go into the details, but let me move towards the most recent work which we have been working on. This is the work of Dr. Nayan Wong, who just uh, completed his PhD. And in this case, we asked ourselves, instead of using a hole, what will happen if you open a slot or a ring? So again, the same process, you take in the phosphate substrates and put some silicon dioxide, put some photoresis, do electron lithography. In, in, instead of opening holes, you start opening uh, these stripes or rings, and then try to grow these into these structures and then see, and then how the growth takes place. And of course, my colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Sean Yuan, who is in Changsha now, CSU, and Dr. Philip Karaf and Professor Botan also really led this particular program as well. Again, Nayan Wong has spent a lot of time in optimizing various growth conditions in order to be able to really get optimum uh, structures. And again, I just want to acknowledge my students and postdocs. I'm clicking through various slides, but in order to get these beautiful results, they might have spent a year or two and sometimes three years in order to get the best, uh, for excellent results or so, I want to thank them for their hard, all their hard work and persistence and perseverance. So here is a case, Nayan opens up a slot along a partic this particular crystallographic orientation, 
and they are, are which is covered with silicon dioxide only in this blue region is indium phosphide is exposed he puts it into the emulsivity reactor and again the same way has grown the indium phosphide nano wise by using selective epitaxy and then by optimizing the growth conditions he is able to show that whenever you open a slot you can create these membranes with this particular facets on top of these membranes or so and then whereas if you open the slot along another crystallographic orientation again it grows these structures indium phosphide you can see that you can also create membranes here, but then the facet here is different than this particular one. And because of the lateral growth on this facet, you end up having slightly thicker membranes than these thin membranes, which is able to get in this particular crystallographic orientation. But we open the slot in between these two crystallographic orientations. Now you can see you can create the beautiful diamond-like structures with these alternating facets of this one and this one, the, the yellow one and the blue one. So you can see you can get a beautiful structures like the diamond-like structures, and it really opens up opportunities for us instead of just only growing nano wires and uh, so the nano membranes, nano rings, and of course nano diamonds and a wide variety of structures. And again, this work has been published in uh, ACS Nano and also earlier in Nano Letters as well. And uh, our uh, editor in chief of ACS Nano is here with us. And we want to thank him and his editors for really allowing us to publish our work in, in, the, in the journal. So what will happen if you open the rings? So here's a case where when you open the rings, again, by optimizing various growth conditions, Nain spent a lot of time, and he's able to show that you can really get a beautiful ring-like structures with these alternating facets of those two types of facets, which I mentioned to you earlier. If you keep on growing, what happens is that this entire area gets filled up and you can see wide variety of facets. And even if you keep on growing further, then what happens is that you end up finishing off with these hexagonal facets because these are the low en lowest energy facets and that's what crystals end up being. They prefer to be at the lowest energy facet conditions or so. Now you can see you can create nano rings, nano membranes, and uh, wide variety of structures you can make uh, using this selective epitaxy process. So we've taken these nano rings and nano wires, and nano diamonds and nano membranes and looked at the cathode luminescence. In this case, we put this unit in an electron microscope, and then we excite these nanowires with the electron beam rather than a laser beam, and look at the light coming out of these ones. Electron beam also can create electron hole pairs, and then you can look at this cathode luminescence. You can see the top view of these nanostructures, wide variety of them, and all of them are emitting bright light, and also emitting very uniform light, indicating that these are excellent nanostructures with no defects whatsoever, if you get the defects, and they won't be emitting the uniform light, for example. So really, hard work of Nain Wong has really paid off quite excellently. So again, we have been working on a wide variety of structures. You can see uh, you know, different shapes you can really create. And then depending on what application you have, you can choose what particular type of devices you want to have. You can be able to make these ones. And then that's what we've been working on till now. I've only spoken about materials. Let me now towards devices, lasers. So lasers, all of us have studied in undergraduate optics courses and uh, lasers, you need to have a laser cavity, you need to have a gain medium, and then the cavity is generated by these mirrors. And this mirror has got a highest re high reflectivity and this mirror has got low reflectivity and light bounces back and forth if you keep on pumping the gain medium. And once the model gain is larger than the optical losses in the cavity, and the lasing starts taking place. Essentially, that's a place where you create the so-called population inversion. So you can see the threshold condition for lasing. Essentially, what it says is that the gain need to be at least equal to the losses, then only lasing will start taking place. There's a standard optics course uh, we all studied in this one. So, okay. So now, if you take a nanowire, if you shine light, then what happens is that the nanowire acts like a waveguide. Light start coming from the both ends of the nanowire because of the fact that nanowire acts like a fabric cavity, and then the light is reflected at the both ends of the nanowire because of the large refractive index difference between indium phosphide and then the A. Indium phosphide refractive index is 3.4, A refractive index is one. So that's what creates the reflectivity at both ends of the nanowire. Now you can see, I don't need to do anything. If you take the right kind of nanowire, and indium phosphide is a direct band gap semiconductors, that means it's got optical gain, and then the both, and also the nanowire acts like a waveguide, and then both ends of the nanowire act like mirrors. And in principle, each nanowire should act like a laser. So that means if I can create a large number of nanowires, and then I can make also a large number of lasers, for example. 
So again, we have been working in this area for a long time, for about 10 years or so. And then the first gallimarsinine nanowire lasers have been demonstrated by my student, by Dr. Drew Saxena, who is at a research associate in uh, Imperial College in UK. And he has demonstrated room temperature operation of gallimarsinine nanowire lasers. Dr. Chian Gao, who is in Sydney, and she has demonstrated in impossible nanowire lasers operating at room temperature. Dr. Tim Burgess, who is at IP Australia, he has demonstrated zinc doped gallimarsinine nanowire lasers or so. So we'll not have time to talk about all of them. I'm only going to talk about one or two examples of how we are able to make these ones. In order to be able to make these nanowire lasers, the simulations play an important role. Drew Saxena has looked at the various optical modes propagating through a nanowire and also looking at the diameter of the nanowires and what should be the diameter of the nanowire or so. Here is an example of the case where he has shown the TM01 mode, how it is propagating through a 260 nanometer gallimarsinine mass nine nanowire or so. And again, Drew's simulations are showing what should be the diameter of the nanowire or so. And again, based on his simulations, and we have identified about 250 to 300 nanometer diameter gallimarsinine mass nine nanowires are ideal for making nanowire lasers. So here's an example of the case where the cut the long story short, and then an extensive work, and we've really made these gallimarsinide, and aluminum gallimarsinide, and four shell nanowires, about six microns long, about 260 nanometers in diameter. We pump these, I transfer them onto a glass slide, we pump these nanowires, and then below threshold, you can see a broad light emission, a spontaneous emission like an LED, but above threshold, you're getting a sharp light emission like a laser. And you can also see the interference fringes, beautiful interference fringes coming from this nanowire laser. He compares these ones with the simulations, and uh, Drew has done that one. And these uh, simulated results and experimentally measured interference fringes match very well, indicating that we're really getting an excellent room temperature operation of these lasers. You can see the output versus pump intensity characteristics, a threshold like behavior here. And below this it acts like a LED, above this acts like a laser. Again, we plotted the log log plot of the output versus input, and you can see the S type curve again confirms that truly lasing is taking place or so. So, again, this work has been published more than seven years back or so. So, what are we using these lasers for? So, here's a case where uh, this is we collaborate with our colleagues at the University of Strathclyde, Professor Antonio Hurtado, Professor Michael Strain, and Professor Martin Dawson. They developed a technique called nanoscale transfer printing. In this case, they come up with a PDMS stamp, where is a soft polymer material, and they can pick up the nanowire laser like this, and then they can drop it off wherever you want. So thereby you can locate these nanowires wherever you need them. So this again, a research fellow in that group, uh, Ben Hogg will have spent a lot of time in really developing this technique along with the professors there. So here's a case where they've taken these nanowire lasers of indium phosphide, and then they've transferred them onto PDMS surface as a soft surface, for example, IOP. Their institute name is called Institute of Photonics. You can see IOP, they're able to locate them nicely. And then after transferring, they pop these ones and verify that all these lasers are working, indicating that it's a very gentle process. You're not creating any damage during this nanoscale transfer printing process of these delicate nanowire lasers. So you may ask the question that, you know, you're really transferring onto soft surfaces like PDMS. What about transferring down to hard surfaces? So here's a case where exactly the same question I asked, and then they've transferred these ones onto flexible glass because we want to make use of these lasers for flexible optoelectronics applications. Like that's why we're transferring onto PDMS surfaces and uh, uh, flexible glass and other things or so. You can see that these are the optical image of these nanowire lasers. And then afterwards, you can see that they're pumping and looking at the light coming from both ends of the nanowire. And again, this threshold-like behavior, sharp light emission, indicating that even after transferring onto hard surfaces, they are not creating any damage during this process. And they could be used for flexible optical electronics applications, also for sensors and a range of things, for example. So then I asked them, can we be able to really locate these nanowire lasers into nano antennas? This is the work of my uh, end colleague, Professor Pang Pang Ren. She is now at Nanjing University. And then she came and worked in our group for some time as a decorative fellow. So you can see that she has been designing these terahertz metamaterials of nano antennas. So there's an aluminum nano antenna. And there's a middle, there's a, in the middle, there's a gap. And then I asked my colleagues in staff client whether they'll be able to locate these nanowires in this gap in this nano antenna or so. As you can see, they're able to do that one. Here's a close-up of this particular antenna here. 
of this aluminum antenna, bullseye antenna, and then the narrow wire laser is sitting here. Then you do not have any nano antenna. Light is coming from the both ends of the nano wire, as I told you, because the nano wire act like a fabric of cavity. But whereas once if the nano antenna is there, so now the radiation pattern is completely changed. Now suddenly the light starts coming from the vertical direction. And so that means you're able to get the vertical emitting nano wire lasers rather than the edge emitting nano wire lasers or so. Again, you can see threshold like behavior, light in, uh, output versus input characteristics. And again, also sharp light emission indicating that we're able to really create vertical emitting nano wire lasers. And uh, again, this has been published a couple of years back or so. So now we can see, we can put ordered patterns in the two dimensional area of these nano wire lasers, which are emitting in the vertical direction. They could be used for a broad range of applications, for example, patient recognition, or otherwise for, uh, by designing the right way for also creating the holograms, for example, coming out of your phone. And also they could be used for meta optics applications where coherent light sources are particularly needed, for example. So really these are exciting times for us and be able to make use of these particular lasers. So till now, all these lasers which I showed you are optically pumped lasers, but ultimately industry wants to have electrically pumped lasers. This is the work of uh, Dr. Im Su Kang, and uh, he came from Samsung and he returned back. Now he's a research engineer there. And then in fact, we wanted to look at these ones. And as I told you, we need to have a PN junction in order to be able to make electrical injected lasers. And then we P-type dope the indium phosphide here, and then put a quantum well of indium gallium arsenide, that the yellow one here, and then this blue one is N-type indium phosphide. Again, in transfer transfer this one down to glass slides, and then make metal contacts of gold titanium at both ends using electron magnetography. Again, it's a lot of involved process and needs to spend a lot of time in optimizing these conditions. You can see the light uh, current versus uh, voltage characteristics. You can expect to have a diode-like behavior showing that we truly have got a PN junction and then uh, you know, we're able to really get this one working very well. So now the light output versus wavelength here and then as a function of the injected current. You can see the higher the amount of current here in SUC has been injecting, higher the amount of light which is coming out. And again, you see two peaks of the light emission coming from these ones. Why is that? It turns out this quantum well of Indian gallium arsenide which is created, this radial axial quantum well and radial, this radial quantum well has got a different thickness and composition. And with respect to the uh, axial quantum well which is growing on the top of the nano wire here, and because of these differences in this composition and thickness of these quantum wells, you end up having light emission at two different peak emissions or so. And again, this is uh, really emitting in this infrared region of the spectrum, 1.3, 1.55 micron window region, which is a region which is important for optical fiber communications or so. So you see, we're able to show these are only acting like a LED, but not like a laser. You ask the question, why? What is, what, why, why you're not able to make lasers? It turns out, if you put metals on the nano wires, metals have got large optical losses. So now that means, you know, if, because you've got the cavity losses are there, you have to pump them harder in order to be able to get over the losses. In the process, what happens is you're generating more heat. If you generate heat, the gain comes down, it becomes like a vicious circle. So that means we really need to explore how to get rid of the metals and still be able to inject current into these nano wires, for example. Is now we got a new student, Ms. Nikita Gagrani, and she is working uh, uh, with really trying to come up with the new ways of really putting non-metal contacts and then be able to inject current into these particular devices or so. Hopefully in a year or two years time, I'll be able to show you electrical injected nano wire lasers and those lasers will find enormous amount of applications. So in addition to doing a single nano wire LEDs and then INSUC also created these arrays of nano wires, which I told you earlier. And then he fills these ones with the polymer material he selectively etches this polymer material by using plasma etching and deposits some indium tin oxide, which is a transmit conducting oxide on the top, puts some metal contact on the top and the bottom, injects the current, and looks at the light emission from these structures. So as you can see, the IV characteristics, again, showing like a diode-like behavior, showing that uh, these uh, vertically uh, nano wire error is also has got acting like a PN junction. And as and when you're injecting more and more current, you can see that the higher the amount of uh, light coming out of these ones. In fact, you can really see with your visual eye, naked eye, and you can see the bright light coming from under the probe here, indicating that we're able to really create these uh, nanowire LED arrays, for example. 
So because of the fact that we're embedding these LEDs in a polymer material, we can peel these things off. So that means they could be used for flexible display applications or so. Samsung and Apple and others are interested, and Huawei and others are interested in making flexible LED displays. And uh, so then uh, flexible, uh, the computers and other things. So that's why people are interested in making these LED displays and particularly making them flexible by embedding them in the polymer materials or so. Again, this work has been published during the last two years or so. So now let me move from nanowires into other, other devices like terahertz radiation. Terahertz radiation is uh, really an exciting area because uh, electronics, as you know, that we work in microwaves and then also millimeter waves. And in the case of optics and photonics, we uh, start from you know, X-rays to ultraviolet to the visible to the infrared region. There used to be a gap for terahertz gap for many years. Only the, during the last 20 years or so, terahertz technologies have been developed. And uh, so, which we and many other groups have been working in this particular area. Why we are interested in terahertz radiation? Terahertz radiation, many chemical molecules have got signatures in the terahertz parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here is a case of the signatures of lactose, monohydrate, and hydrate or so. Many explosives and many medical drugs also have got signatures in the terahertz part of the spectrum. So that's why people are interested developing sources, compact sources and detectors for terahertz spectroscopy and be able to identify various chemical molecules, for example. But it also turns out that the terahertz radiation is reflected by metals. So that means you can really make use of them for, for example, in the airports, for example, these days people are not using X-rays anymore because X-rays really create uh, damage to your DNA because it's ionizing radiation. But whereas terahertz radiation is a non-ionizing radiation. So that's why if in fact this, uh, this, this big box which you get into, and that's where terahertz imaging systems have been used to be able to identify you got any metal uh, uh, things on your, on your body or not. But also this terahertz radiation could be used for biomedical imaging applications. You can see the teeth and imaging of the teeth here. They could be used for wireless communications because you can download the information onto your smartphone, like a movie or whatever you want to download without any connections or anything of that sort using a wireless way. But also terahertz radiation is very useful for looking at the water content in leaves so thereby you're only watering the crops when the, they need to be uh, watered rather than wasting your precious resource of water, for example. So really, terahertz radiation has got a wide range of applications. So just to give, remind you that one terahertz is about 300 microns in wavelength. It's a really long wavelength uh, beyond the infrared region of the spectrum here. Again, this work, which we have been working on sources and detectors, and I'll give you the detector applications here. This is a joint work with Oxford University. Professor Michael Johnston, Professor Laura Hertz's groups there. So in fact, this is the work of my student, Kun Pan. Now she is uh, at Oxford University as a postdoctoral fellow. We have been looking at, for example, she we put some nano, one nano wire onto a quartz substrate because quartz is transformed to terahertz radiation. And Kun has fabricated this particular device and putting some electron emulatography, making these metal pads and making connections to these nano wires here, which is a tiny nano wire there. Then we excite this nanowire with the laser pulse so that you can generate photocarriers. And then you come up with the terahertz pulse and the electric field of the terahertz pulse separates the carriers between these two contacts. So if you can measure the photocurrent as a function of time, if you can measure the current as a function of time, you can really calculate the electric field of the terahertz pulse and also conductivity of the material which you're dealing with as well. So this is uh, really, that's what we've been trying to make use of to be able to make these terahertz detectors, for example. Again, to cut the long story short, in about four years of work of, is during her PhD, Kun Pung has demonstrated broadband with phase and amplitude uh, uh, sensitive room temperature terahertz detectors. But most recently, during her postdoctoral fellowship at Oxford University, she has developed these polarization result terahertz detectors. So, in this case, what she has done is that she has used these bauta antennas. She puts the con narrow wires in, in the wood, uh, orthogonal direction here. And so thereby you're able to measure both the X and Y polarization, for example. You can see the scanning electron microscope image of the close-up of these ones. Two nanowires are connecting these nano antennas. And then there are also nanowires at the bottom here. And the key challenge has been not allowing these top nanowires to be in physical contact with the bottom nanowires. And that's where we work with our colleagues at Strathclyde University and where they're able to really make this using their nanoscale transfer printing process very carefully able to minimize, avoid any contact at these crosses here 
so that we'll be able to measure both the X and Y polarization. So here's a case, we, we just to cut this long story short, and we are looking at uh, what we want to use these nanowire detectors for, for looking at metamaterials, for example. To take, fabricate a metamaterial, we excite this one, the terahertz uh, pulse, and then essentially that terahertz pulse transmits it to this one, and then you can measure the X and Y polarization that gives you the information about what, it, what material you got, what are the properties of this metamaterial, for example, here. Kung Pung has fabric designed and fabricated these meta, terahertz metamaterials. And uh, so you can see that uh, simulations show that the X polarization, Y polarization have this much of transmission here. And then our detector shows really very nicely, very much, uh, very much similar to that of the Watts theoretically predicted by Kung Pung here. So indicating that these detectors are very, very useful. In fact, this work has been published in Science last year or so, and allows us to be able to make a room temperature polarization and phase sensitive and amplitude sensitive terahertz detectors with a broad bandwidth. So really, they are, we are very much looking forward to developing these terahertz imaging systems, which have got a high resolution because of the fact that these nanowires are very small and the antennas are also much smaller than normal ones which we're dealing with, for example. So now let me move towards nanowire solar cells. Solar cells, and all of us have studied about solar cells and you need to have a P injection. You need to make the material thick enough to absorb all the light. And then the photogenerated carriers can be, uh, need to be picked up by the, so the contacts at the top and the bottom. And then of course, some of the carriers will be lost to the impurities and defects and all these things because carriers need to migrate long distances here. But whereas if you take a nanowire, you can make the nanowire as long as you want to absorb all the light and you can create a portion P injection here. So that means carriers can be collected very efficiently in this case. For the first time, we are decoupling the light absorption and carrier collection pathways using nanowires or cells. Also, because of the high refractive index of nanowires, they can absorb the light very efficiently. Right? They act like a light funnels. Otherwise, like acts like a light concentrators, for example. But also these nanowires have got a low, anti, uh, low reflection properties. So that means, and uh, so it means you don't need to put any anti-reflection coatings and all these things. So that's why there's a lot of interest in developing nanowires solar cells. So here is a case where, and uh, we are doing a lot of simulations, FT3D simulations, finite difference time domain simulations of carrier generation profile, for example, to determine what should be the height of the nanowire? What should be the diameter of the nanowire? What should be the distance between the nanowires or pitch between the nanowires, for example? Here's a case where we're showing the carry generation profile of a nanowire. You can see that most of the current is generated. This red part is the highest amount of current. is generated the tip of the nanowire, indicating that you don't need to make a long nanowires. About one or two micron long nanowires are more than sufficient to be able to make efficient solar cells. We also looked at the diameter of the nanowire. Again, 150, 160 nanometer diameter is, uh, is giving the highest amount of current. And again, the diameter to pitch ratio should be somewhere between 0.5 or 0.6, which gives the optimum conditions or so. Again, these simulations are playing an important role as a guide for making the right kind of solar cells, for example. Again, we have made this uh, solar uh, gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide nanowires. And then you fill this one with the BCB polymer and circulate these ones so that you can expose the tips of the nanowires. And then you put some indium tinoxide contact by sputtering and put titanium gold contact at the bottom so that you'll be able to shine light and collect the current from these ones. Again, to cut the long story short, and uh, so these are some of the highest efficiency nanowire solar cells. And then uh, from our colleagues from Technical University of Eindhoven and FOM Institute in Emol, Eric Garnett and Eric Barkas uh, dem demonstrated these ones. And you can see that sure, you can really get very good efficiency solar cells. And because of the fact that we're embedding these ones into polymer materials, you can also peel them off so that you can really create a flexible solar cells, for example. So this is the work which we are doing with Professor Laura Hertz's group at Oxford University, where she is an expert in organic semiconductors. Instead of using the, you know, structural polymers like PDMS or PCB, by using inorganic and organic semiconductors, inorganic nanowires of gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, organic semiconductors like P3, HT, PCB, MG2, MUH, PBB, and thereby you'll be able to really make use of best of both worlds or so. And because of the fact that these are embedded in these materials, you can easily peel these things off. In fact, this was accidentally found by one of my students and where when she was doing this uh, pooling of these samples to measure the photocurrent, 
And then because of the thermal mismatch between the substrate and then the polymer, and these things started peeling off very nicely. So now this opens up a lot of opportunities and our hope is we'll be able to really pro provide you in the future flexible solar cells, which you can put on a backpack and then be able to charge your battery uh, electronic devices while you're you know, walking around in the, in the streets and other things because of the sunlight is falling on the solar cells and it helping you to be able to do the charging of the devices or so. So now let me move to the next topic of water splitting to generate hydrogen. Again, while the solar cells are very good for uh, the heat, uh, en energy generation, but uh, nighttime you cannot really have the energy from these ones. So you need to have a storable energy and transportable energy. Hydrogen is turning out to be an excellent source from that point. In this case, this is a photoelectrochemical cell. We got a cathode and an anode, and then the photoanode is a semiconductor and a cathode is a metal. And then you take a semiconductor, you shine light on this one, and then you generate electron hole pairs. And these holes are going and uh, essentially you know, oxidizing water. And uh, so then electrons are going and reducing protons to be able to create hydrogen here. And again, the semiconductor need to have at least 1.2 electron volts, uh, three electron volts, that is the redox potentials of water. And then also you need to have a bit larger ones because you need to really cover for the losses as well. This is a work led by my colleagues, Dr. Shiva Karturi and Professor Botan in my group, for example. So in fact, this is a, the Professor Zetian Mi from Michigan University has looked at a wide variety of materials to look at which are the best materials for this purpose. Many, of course, many people are working in a wide variety of materials. Ideally, you want to have a material which is really covering, straddling the redox potents of water, also absorbing the visible light, and then which, which, which really also stable in this process as well. As you can see, some materials are very good, like titanium oxide, very stable material, but it, it only absorbs the UV light, for example. But uh, some materials are uh, very efficient, but they're not stable, for example. So then he suggested that you know indium gallium nitride, which will be very good in terms of being able to absorb most of the visible light, at the same time also straddle the redox potentials or so. Again, in fact, I borrowed this slide from ZTM. So in fact, we have been looking at gallium nitride nanorods because it's much easier to make gallium nitride rather than indium gallium nitride nanorods. And then we looked at the photocurrent density as a function of the uh, or potential of these structures. But it turns out that even though gallium nitride is very difficult to chemically etch, but in this uh, photo, uh, uh, the catalysis conditions, and in fact, this uh, gallium nitride starts getting uh, the corroded, photo corroded, and in the process, its stability is not very good. Then we coated these ones with the cobalt oxide, which is a co catalyst. By doing that one, not only are protecting the surface of gallium nitride, they're also acting like a co catalyst also. We're able to show that they can get a very stable. Uh, the, uh, the st very stable uh, photo uh, anodes and we're able to demonstrate these ones. But of course, still the challenge with the gallium nitride is that uh, still it's not absorbing the visible light, but at least it is showing that we're able to really demonstrate that it is important to make sure that uh, you're able to stabilize these surfaces. Essentially, cobalt oxide also acts like a whole scavenger. So that's why we're able to really get the stable structures from these ones. So, so which again, we published this work and published many other works in this area, but don't have time to talk about. Let me really finish off with that part of the talk by just showing one of the recent work which we have done by using uh, the perovskite solar cells and silicon tannin absorbers, by using these ones, by using the photocatalysis uh, and also the photo, photo cathode and also the solar cell, by doing the combination of these ones, we're able to really show the, the, the perovskite silicon tannin absorber standalone solar water splitting with a 17% efficiency or so. In fact, this particular group have identified this as one of the top innovations in 2020 or so, able to show that this standalone system without having to make any you know, electricity connections or anything. Solar cell is really providing all the power needed in order to be able to make the photocatalysis also with excellent efficiency. From them. Let me finish off with the last topic. I know that I'm running out of time and I got another five minutes or so, brain repair. So this is the work of my young colleague, Dr. Vinnie Gautam, who is now at uh, the University of Melbourne, working as lecturer. And earlier, she worked in my group after doing her PhD in Bangalore at Jawaharlal Nehru Center there. So as we know that all of us have got 80 billion neurons, and then these neurons form into a beautiful neuronal network. So whenever you got a brain damage due to accident or whatever it is, and then what happens is that you're really breaking this neuronal network, 
and you lose some other functions. You cannot see, you cannot walk, you cannot talk, or some problem or the other takes place. Can we really create neural patches and be able to make these neural networks connections back? So thereby, can we really get the functions back to the people or not? That's our dream of really be able to make these neural connections or so. So as a first step in this process, and Biddy has really looked at these neuronal cells and grown these ones on indium phosphide nanowires. You can see from the top view of the ordered patterns of these indium phosphide nanowires, cell body soma here, and these neurites are really following beautifully these nanowires here. You can see the close up of these ones, these dendrites are coming out of these ones or so. And uh, really, this follows beautifully in these ones. Instead of using a one neuronal cell, what will happen if you put a multiple neuronal cells? If you do this one, what happens is that they really form into a nice neuronal network here. You can see in this box is the one where you got indium phosphide nanowires, and you can see that these dendrites are really following these patterns beautifully in this square pattern or so. If the neurons are outside this uh, indium phosphide nanowire and the flat indium phosphide, these dendrites are all randomly growing. They're not really following a particular pattern or anything of that sort. So she really takes these nanowire, uh, neurons grown on nanowires and a plain glass substrate which the neuroscientists use, and she takes this so-called something called a calcium imaging. What calcium imaging does is that uh, she puts a calcium dye, as and when the action potentials are fired with the neurons, ion channels are opened up, calcium ions are passing through these ion channels, and depending on the concentration of the calcium ions that are available, the fluorescence intensity of the, cal the calcium dye changes. She takes a video of this structure. If this neuron is firing happening to this neuron and this neuron and this neuron, to these astrocytes and various uh, wide variety of things which are there in the brain, and then try to, really try to create correlation maps. If this neuron is firing happening, what's happening to this neuron and are they firing together or independently or so? So again, after uh, three years of her work, and she's able to show that whenever the neurons are grown in glass substrates and the change in fluorescence as a function of time, they're all firing randomly. And you can see very little correlation in this particular instance. But whereas when the neurons are grown on indium phosphide nanowires, and you can see that the change in fluorescence as a function of time, they're all firing at the same time. And you see excellent correlation coefficient and showing that some sort of a synchronized and correlated activity is taking place in this neuronal network, for example. So when Billy presented this work at a neuroscience conference a couple of years back in Melbourne, and neuroscientists were asking what neurons you're using. She said she is using rat neurons. They said, why are you wasting your time on rat neurons? In the rat neurons, how about using stem cells? So in fact, uh, after a couple of years, we managed to get some funding uh, from Dementia Australia and Unville Bar Foundation. And now we got a group of people with, from Melbourne. Those are the stem cell biologists and computer scientists. And then also the uh, glia cell expert here and another neurobiologist and a nanotechnology experts. We're really developing, making use of these Alzheimer's, the, the, the stem cells from the Alzheimer's patients and then trying to really create microorganoids, or so-called mini brains from these structures, and also from the healthy people, and then trying to compare uh, the, these uh, mini brains which are created from the Alzheimer's patients and then the healthy people, and then how the signaling behavior is changing, and then trying to use artificial intelligence techniques to be able to really understand and then be able to develop some new algorithms so that we can stimulate the people with Alzheimer's or so, and then be able to really help, hopefully help be able to really get some other functions back or so. We've also been making lots of new nano electrodes to be able to measure these signals much more, much more uh, uh, sensitively and also be able to use them for stimulating the neuronal structures and other things. It's really an exciting project with uh, working with the multiple groups of people and I'm really excited and I'm learning a lot in terms of the neuroscience because I'm not an expert in neuroscience, for example. That's the beauty of, again, nanotechnology is uh, Professor Paul Weiss mentions, and it's really truly a multidisciplinary discipline field. In conclusion, nanowires open up opportunities for manipulation of light matter interaction at the nanoscale and developing new class of lasers and LEDs and uh, terahertz detectors. And again, we also work on terahertz modulators, but I'll not have time to talk about. And in fact, this is a student uh, server Baig, who did a PhD at Cambridge University in Hannah Joyce's group, and uh, jointly with Oxford and Cambridge and ANU, we demonstrated these terahertz modulators and integration of optoelectronic devices on various platforms. And I also demonstrated nanowire solar cells and PEC water splitting and engineering the growth of neuronal networks or so. Once again, I want to thank our funding agencies. And I also want to leave you with some information 
about applied physics reviews. And uh, this is a uh, high impact original research and reviews journal with an impact factor of 17.05. I'm an editor in chief of this particular journal. And then if you really have got some exciting breakthrough results at our review articles, and either you can send it to applied physics reviews, and also you can send it to ACS Nano. I also serve on the editorial board. And uh, I, along, uh, with, I want to thank Paul for inviting me to that one. Again, I mentioned to you that we're looking for PhD students and postdocs. Please uh, keep an eye on this uh, website for looking at any you know, advertisement for these ones, which will happen in the next month or so. Again, also that my wife and I have started an endowment to really support students and physicists to come from develop, coming from developing countries to come and spend some time to learn about uh, research and then working with my colleagues at the AEU. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Yeah, Professor Jack Pish, wonderful talk. Yeah, there, there are a lot of things, yeah, uh, questions waiting for you. So first we go to this one. Yeah, Professor Jack Pish, very exciting talk. Thanks for the patterning, uh, pattern growing of nanowares. Do you need to pre-treat the surface of the substrate? I think that's the first part of your talk. Okay, that's, that's a good question. So of course, what we, uh, we fabricate this, uh, we create these patterns and also we do something called trim etching just before the growth. And thereby you're removing a thin layer of indium phosphide. So thereby if any oxide or anything of the stick there with the sample. Okay, great. I see a look at that beautiful structure. So I'm thinking that it's all the waiver level, right? They can make that waiver level. Yes, we can make the waiver level. At the moment, what we're doing is a small areas because we're using electron lithography. But what we're doing is that first we identify what conditions are the what structures are the best for device applications. Yeah. Then if we identify those dimensions, then we can make a vapor scale once using nano imprint lithography, which we have in our laboratory. Or anywhere, if you've got a nanoimprint lithography, you'll be able to make wafer scale structures without any problems. Yes, that's very important. The first, you should define the, you know, the method and then the device's structures. Yeah, yes. how it uh, works. Then that's the time. May, uh, the next choice is a mass production. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question is, uh, yeah, this question is, uh, a students ask for a question about nanoware laser. How about its uh, power consumption? And uh, is there a uh, ultra low power consumption? Yes, that's, that's what, at the moment, of course, we are only doing optical injected lasers, for example. But mm -hmm. our hope is that, you know, ultimately, these small lasers have got a small gain volume. So that means you only need to pump and uh, low power and low energy is needed. In fact, the smaller mm -hmm. the laser, two things and advantages. One is smaller the laser, that means you consume less energy. Also smaller the laser, you can switch it on and off faster. So that means you can really use it for faster communications or so. But it's essentially green internet and green photonics and other things because uh, at the moment internet is using huge amounts of energy. We really need to see how we can really reduce the energy usage of this internet. And that's where we are really developing these small devices. Okay, that's good. I think several years ago, um, sometimes, yeah, I met someone, and they say that they can put a project into the cell phone. So, but I didn't see the real product. But I mean, maybe your laser, you know, yeah, uh, the super you, uh, lower consumption, the laser can make that happen. Yeah. So that's what ultimately our aim is, uh, Alice. And in fact, we want to be able to make uh, you know, holograms coming out of his, uh, your phone so that you can see the person in three dimensions and that yeah. we want to be able to feel like a virtual reality sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, later we will, you know, all join on this virtual reality system. <laughs> exactly, very good. Uh, okay, the next question is uh, Professor Jack Dish as an expert on the nanoware on Cap Nanotube. Can you comment on the Cap Nanotube computer? Oh, carbon nanotubes is a different ball game altogether. So of course, this is uh, carbon nanotubes. Research has been going on again for 30 plus years or so. 
But the, one of the challenges has been to be able to really produce a carbon energy which are pure. As, as many of you know, that uh, the changes in the chirality of the nano, uh, nanotubes end up having either semiconducting properties or metallic properties or in between. So then the challenge has been to be able to really create in a reproducible way and these nanowires. So in the most re recent years, and people are able to really develop these things. And uh, so most likely these carbon nanotubes and other things potentially could be used as interconnects and other things, but still there are lots of challenges one need to really address. Remember that whenever you're making computer chips, the really the yield of these devices on a you know, 12 inch vapor, that means you know, in a silicon vapor, for example, like a dinner plate, and the more than 99.99% uh, yield which they are able to they are able to achieve something. In order to be able to achieve those sorts of yields, there's an enormous sort of engineering takes place, and that's where the challenges will be. Yes, yeah, that's I think now uh, many people was working on this. Yeah, they trying to make uh, you know carbon nanotube to be some real electronic devices and they even do uh, computing. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, you know, they made the challenges also, they have a bright futures, I hope. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yep. yeah, next question is pretty long. Let me uh, see that. Dear Professor Jagdish, thanks for sharing the latest work of telehertz devices. I'm a newcomer. Yeah, uh, would you give me some suggestion for the direction that this field, like materials or devices? So uh, just for the telehertz field you're talking about, sure. Yeah, I think they, this one was a newcomer in the terahertz field. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, that's fine. So basically, the terahertz is really an exciting area. And of course, already there are systems available. And then why we are still working on terahertz systems? The problem is the resolution of the imaging systems using terahertz radiation have not been very good. So that's why we've been developing these nanowire-based detectors, which can be able to, I can put, for example, a, you know, terahertz radiation, about, you're talking about 300 microns in wavelength. So that means so the terahertz spot is quite big. If I can put a multiple detectors within that play, a spot, and I'll be able to really have at a much higher resolution imaging or so. So that's where the, you know, we are really exploring these ones and trying to develop these ones as well. But also people have been trying to look at the terahertz communications, for example. So that's one of the reasons that we are really developing these modulators so mm -hmm. that you really be able to build a fast communications like a line of sight communications or so, for example, from building to building and things like that sort of thing, for example. And uh, so that's why we're exploring those ones as well. So there's a need for improving the materials as well as devices. Both go hand in hand in my view. If your materials are not good and your devices are not going to be good. So you need to address both of them hand in hand. Okay, let's say that, uh, yeah, for the students who answer these questions, uh, remember that uh, both material and the devices are very important. You need, uh, you know, to make both of them excellent. Yeah, okay. That's cool. Yeah, uh, the next question is a uh, wonderful talk. Uh, flexible solar cell by the nanoware is exciting. How about its efficiency? And is that uh, stretchable and watchful? Yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. So at the moment, the efficiency of the solar cells, uh, nanoware solar cells have been uh, about 17% or so. But in my view, there is a more potential to be able to make them more efficient as well. But all these solar cells which have been reported till now have got the actual PN junction. As I told you that if you can create a radial PN junction, you'll be able to really collect, mm -hmm. carry much more efficiently. But the challenge has been how to make contacts in these actual PN junctions and other things. And mm -hmm. we and others have been really struggling with that one. So there's a lot of work need to be done. If you really solve that problem, we'll be able to create a more efficient uh, uh, solar cells. And again, you know, if you, by coating these ones with the polymer material, you'll be able to really protect that one from the environment. And I don't see that as a major issue. Also, we found the mechanical properties of the nanowires are very interesting. That if you have got a smaller diameter nanowires, their elasticity is much, much bigger. For example, we were able to show you can introduce more than 10% strain in these nanowires and bend them like uh, a half the circle and without any issues. And then it's really this really exciting time from that point of view. In fact, uh, Professor Ting Sang, the uh, next speaker, is, is an expert in flexible electronics and he's going to tell you about all the exciting things he's doing. Wow, it's interesting. I'm glad to know that for the me mechanical properties so well. Yeah, so very good. It looks like this will have a wonderful future because now you know a lot of people need the backpack. 
right? Need a lot of things, yeah, can be powered at any time. I think this flexible solar cell, you know, pan, panel will be happen, uh, helped very well. Okay, yeah, so uh, actually I have a question for your last part uh, for the engineering and nano, na uh, narrow network. So uh, is that one already or uh, collaborate with the doctors? Now, what, uh, what is the uh, thesis you are fighting for? Okay, so the, one of the problems which Alice, what I'm finding is that the, the minute you get into biology, mm -hmm. things, things move much more slowly because of the fact that the biology is you know, always a very you know, complex system, for example. Yes. Small changes in the system can really end up creating, for example, you know, cells stop growing, for example, then you know, maybe a small changes in the medium, for example, can have a huge impact on these devices and all things. So coming back to these ones, you know, the already there, for example, I've in fact visited uh, two years back the University of California, San Diego, Professor Shadi Dayas group where he has been using some of these uh, narrower electrodes and uh, to measure the neuronal signals. In fact, he's been collaborating with the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and surgeons have been really using these nano electrodes and be able to look at the way the signals are coming from the brain, particularly for the people, those who got the, uh, the uh, the epilepsy, and when they do the survey, and they know which part of the brain is really uh, has uh, in, leads to the uh, the epilepsy, but you know now they're able to measure and then be able to do the surgery in a localized way, sort of thing. Really, an exciting time. I've seen some beautiful videos, and also that when you're doing these things, you need to make sure that these are all biocompatible. And every step yeah. you need to show they're always, for example, if you're putting you're using these electrodes and other things for human beings you need to make sure that they're really safe for people as well. Again, biocompatibility and other things really play an important role as well. Okay, thank you very much. We're really looking forward to that. Now we came to the part of our, uh, our wonderful part is I want to deliver this certification to you. So for uh, your wonderful talk, Canary World and the Universe. So I can ask, give you a special certification. So I hope I can deliver this to you next time face to face in person. But now it's uh, you know on the stage, so uh, you very well deserve it, Professor Jack Dish. Okay, Shishini Alice, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, you're great. Now we come to the panel discussion. Uh, we have uh, three uh, speakers from a different part. We have our wonderful chair Pavis here. So everyone, hello, uh, happy New Year. And uh, this was our first panel in the uh, new year. Yeah, so first I introduce uh, one by one, Professor Jack Lee, so everyone know, Professor Ting Zhang from Sudo. Yeah, uh, Paul, yeah, please. Yeah, so from uh, LA, yeah. So this was our first panel. Our first panel, of course, have uh, some big news, right? Paul, yeah, you ready to share the big news? <laughs> okay. So yeah, that's the big news. Uh, we are yeah very glad and very proud to announce that this time we invited Professor Jackis to join our ICAX tax team as co-organizers. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, and uh, so it's a really pleasure for me to work with uh, Paul and you, Alice. And it's really I'm very much looking forward to working with both of you to really be able to spread the knowledge and science to the uh, you know, next generation and also public as well. Okay, Paul, please. I couldn't think of anyone better to work with. It's your uh, delight uh, to, you know, we really miss meeting up in uh, Brazil and China and Australia and everywhere else in the world. And this will give us an opportunity uh, to work together over the coming year before the world reopens and hopefully continuing after that as well here. Thank you very much, Paul. And I'm very much looking forward to as well. And I basically, that's as human beings, uh, we're all social creatures and really missing seeing our colleagues and our uh, young, young, young researchers and all this really missing part of this COVID thing being. Of course, we can do a lot of things virtually, but it's not the same as uh, you know physically meeting and interacting with each other. But let us yeah. do the thing still we get to that opportunity when time comes. <laughs> Okay, uh, Professor T already uh, here, and they listen to I can ask the talks many times. I was getting on the chair on the stage many several times, and now they were going to be the speakers. So, can you say something for this thing, please? Yeah, happy New Year, and uh, welcome, uh, Professor Jagadish. It's a wonderful talk, and uh, 
Welcome to be the coordinator of the ICANN uh, X big family. Uh, really, uh, we are so happy that uh, you join this family and this uh, very famous now is a <laughs> platform for the, all the researchers from the micro and nano uh, field. So welcome. Okay. Happy Thank New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's our big surprise for everyone. I think I keep this secret. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. Uh, so glad to have uh, Professor Jack Nish join the team. I think uh, we will have uh, more kind of results from a different part of the world. Uh, Professor Jack Nish was in Australia. Uh, that's another continental. Yeah, they have a lot of scientists there. They have uh, many, many, you know, uh, uh, researchers and the universities to, to share with us, to connect with the world and uh, universe. I think this was a very good start. And the Professor Jack Dish also has a very plenty of uh, connections with the whole world, right? You have uh, many, many collaborators in the world. I think we can, you know, uh, open to all these uh, newcomers, all these uh, scientists in the whole world to join us. And this, uh, I can ask the talks. Uh, really welcome. And uh, we're looking forward in the coming year. In this year, we have uh, many, many more new things to get on the stage. And uh, as a panel, every time we have um, uh, several common questions, the audience was very uh, interested. Uh, as I say that, uh, Professor Jack Lish, you have uh, more than, you know, a uh, hundred students. You have nursing of them, you know, to be few, uh, super scientists and uh, to be excellent uh, researchers. Uh, do, can you tell us your secret? Yeah, how you training them, how you select them, and how you training them to, you know, be so successful? Oh, thank you very much, Alice. And uh, you see, the, for me, the most enjoyable part of my life has been not my publications, not my awards and recognitions and other things. So seeing the bright young people and seeing their success is the most enjoyable part for me in my life. And what's the legacy I leave behind is my students and postdocs who have gone through my group. And also many postdocs and students I mentor uh, globally. In fact, during traveling, and Paul and I and others, you know, means we really try to interact with a lot of young people and try to really mentor them. And lots of times they come and want to talk to you and then want you to be referee for something. And otherwise they're going through some problem or the other. It's really helping young people is really important once of So in terms of my own way of looking at students, you know, really looking at, you know, the, whether they have got the fire in the belly. That's what is an important part of things sort of thing. And I mean, if you talk to them, are they excited about doing PhD or otherwise they're just going and doing PhD because that's the next step after finishing a master's degree, for example. So again, you know, we, when, when we look at what they've done in their bachelor's degree or master's degree and where they got their degree, and then we also interview them so that we really get to know really they know the fundamentals or not. We ask simple questions like, you know, how a laser works, for example. Somebody wants to work on lasers. The minute you ask them how a laser works, you know, they started shaking already because they're not really telling the right way. So it immediately tells you they really don't know the fundamentals sort of thing. So that's why you have to really get your fundamentals right. So very important part of it. Sort of. So once if we choose the students, again, I encourage also students, sometimes they ask me, you know, uh, how do you really be able to really be stand out with respect to others? I always tell them, you know, try to publish a paper in a journal, not a conference. So that means it immediately shows that you got a research aptitude, and then you also have shown that aptitude by publishing a paper that can open a lot of doors for you. So if that's the only way you can be, particularly if you, done your master's or my bachelor's degree from an, an, a, not from a famous university like CNN University or something, it doesn't matter. But you have to do additional things like publishing a paper by working in a laboratory or something, Philip mm -hmm. at least puts you a standout with, other, with respect to other candidates. In mm -hmm. terms of think generally my job is to really inspire the students and give them the problem and give them the resources, get out of their way. Because I really yeah. don't want to tell them every day what to do. But generally, I tell them that my door is always open. Whenever you got a problem, come and talk to me. And then here are the things which we're really trying to solve. This is an exciting problem where many people are really trying to solve this problem. If you solve this problem, you, your work will have a huge impact in the, in, in the field. And then people will take notice of your work. But then, you know, up to you how we do it sort of thing. And again, also I tell them, first half, I will drive your project. Second half, you should be coming and telling me what we should be doing because you should be the expert on the topic. After you finish your PhD, if somebody comes and asks me, 
And uh, any question about your PhD work, I say that, no, you're talking to the wrong person. My student is the expert and you should go and talk to him or her. So then and always, that's what really makes me very happy when they do that one. Of course, many people want to have our students uh, work as you know, postdocs in you know, Oxford and Cambridge and uh, Imperial and various parts of the world. So that's again, you know, makes me very happy that you know, uh, our students and postdocs are really in high demand and uh, they are doing very well. So again, even after they finish their PhD, I try to mentor them, continue to keep in touch with them, support them whatever the best way I could so. Oh, how nice a story is like a family, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, Professor Paul. Yeah. So can you comment on this? And uh, for the students who publish on ACS Nano, the Turbo Journals, when they got a PhD, right? Before they got a PhD degree. <laughs> yes. Actually, I was going to ask uh, Jagadish if he had uh, questions that he liked to ask prospective students to get a sense of how he thought they would do uh, if they were to be able to join his laboratory. So you have something you like to ask in an interview? Okay, so generally basically what we do is that we just ask them, you know, first of all, I ask the question, why you want to do PhD? Mm -hmm. then, you know, they just, half the time they just say that, what, you know, means why he's asking me that question sort of thing, you know, so then they really don't give, really come up with the night, you know, answer, look, and you know, I'm passionate about doing research, you know, I really wanted to do this one, uh, you know, and so that's why I'm really wanted to do PhD. And uh, so then next question, which you ask is what you want to work on. So then I want to work on a particular thing, whether it's a solar cell or otherwise a, in a laser or a terahertz detector. Then you ask some basic questions, uh, fundamentals, not about the height, you know, what people have published and all these things. How does the solar cell work, for example? You know, sometimes you know, people have a vague idea, but the minute you ask them one or two questions, you know, they just start, uh, you know, I mean, uh, giving answers which are very vague. That immediately knows that that's what I tell people, you know, before you are called to for an interview, at least, you know, what are the topic which you say that you are interested in, at least try to study and understand the basics of those things, you know, simple questions you ask. And Paul, I realize that, you know, people really try to do a lot of advanced things, but then sometimes they forget about the basic fundamental things. By asking that question, that really tells me they are really thinking rightly, right to have not. Yes. <laughs> Great, thank you. Ping, maybe you can tell us the same, uh, you know, how do you interview uh, people in your group and what do you look for? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Paul. And uh, it's uh, also very good questions. And today I also learned a lot from the Professor uh, Jagadish. Mm -hmm. I think for the students and uh, uh, there's a, a you, you are asking the, the interview part, right? Yeah, the interview part. I, uh, I I not only uh, is uh, trying to uh, uh, talk with him about uh, or her about his uh, uh, background and interest. Also, I look into his personality. You know, I think it's also very important. And also, uh, I'd like to ask uh, what's uh, the his goal for the getting the PhD. You know, and, and we know it's a stressful the process uh, during his uh, life. So uh, usually the students with a clear goal and also the optimistic uh, attitude, I think they will be very initiative and also the diligent student. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Paul, what do you, how do you select students? So see, now see, now I'm there also one of the coordinators. It's my job to ask you the same question as well. Yes, okay, very good. So, uh, well, I depend uh, very heavily actually on their previous mentor's recommendation. Uh, and, you know, we've successfully had several students come from the same, uh, same groups and places and have established, you know, some of those uh, pipelines where they're very dependably, you know, uh, well-trained, sharp, uh, diverse interests and we can you know, let them explore uh, new areas uh, by coming to our group. I also depend a lot on my students and postdocs. So we work very much as a team and it's often uh, the case that the candidates share things with my group members that they might not uh, say to me. And so the entire group will know, oh, here's someone you know, who we're thinking about, uh, you know, what are they really interested in? And they may ask the same questions I do uh, but get different answers. 
And so we compare notes and look at where we think there will be, um, you know, where the, we think the candidates' talents will apply. We tend to look for people who don't have the same skills that we already have. We want to bring in people that that have something new for us, and you know, very much like you, uh, the brains of the group are distributed, and so students and postdocs are expected to uh, pitch new ideas to the group, get feedback, and then you know, when they can successfully say why it's important to do something, how we should do it, and what we'll need to do it, other people tend to join in from even across very different areas. So we have people from you know, chemistry, physics, math, uh, engineering, neuroscience, and so forth uh, in the group. And the, uh, you know, those uh, back and forth uh, discussions where we, um, you know, where we go over what it is we want to do next and how we'll support it and so forth turn out to be among the uh, most exciting uh, parts of what we do. Okay, here I have one question. I'm quite serious on this. I saw Professor Jagdish and Paul Weiss. Both of you have a larger group that has very wide topics and many projects. So once a student jump in, normally you will, you know, uh, give them one direction, something uh, clear, you know, direction for the research, or you discuss, you know, to find the uh, direction for them. So uh, who maybe Jack Dish, you go the first. Okay, thank you, Alice. And so basically we identify the topic which they'll be working on. And also we try to identify two or three subtopics which uh, we, we want them to work because we never know. Because see, when you're really trying to look at the cutting edge research, which one ultimately lead to a PhD? I cannot predict them in the beginning. And then in fact, I always tell them that sort of thing. I don't know ultimately what will go into your PhD thesis, but these are the things which we should be exploring sort of thing. But again, we have discussions and also we don't stick to that one rigidly. If they come back, I also keep telling them, look, this is what the globe, the total area which we want to work on, specific area which we want to work on. But at the same time, you know, if you have got some other ideas you what we, what we should be exploring, you should come back and tell me that. And you got a lot of freedom. But I also have got a lot of young researchers in my group and uh, two full professors and other uh, uh, assistant professors or so. And uh, sometimes, you know, a student comes and says that, you know, well, I, I wanted to do this one, but so-and-so professor said, I should not be working on this one sort of thing, you know. Then I always tell them, look, you don't have to tell your supervisor everything you're doing. You know, if you got an idea, go and do it. You don't have to tell anybody. If it works, you go and tell your supervisor, supervisor not going to complain about you. But as if it doesn't work, keep quiet, you know. So this is sometimes, you know, it's a some, you know, it's interesting to see the dynamics of these things. And most important thing for me is to encourage them to think and come up with ideas. So thereby when they leave my group and they become like independent thinkers, independent scientists, and they face the world and drive the science and wherever they go, they are successful. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. So Paul, any secret to share? <laughs> uh, well, I certainly don't tell people in the group what to do. I uh, like them to you know, if they don't have a, a, a clear direction at any given time, then they can go help out with ongoing projects while they explore what, you know, the next steps ought to be. And then we go through those pitches. Uh, they, that doesn't have to be something that we're already doing in the group, but there has to be a unique capability that we have where we don't think other people can do the same work. We have a rule that if other people can do experiments, they can have them. We want to do something that we think will matter uh, where we're uniquely capable, uh, whether we have that ability currently or whether that's something we're going to develop. And so we don't, uh, you know, we, I, I, I definitely never tell people what to do. Sometimes the group members tell me what to do, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> That's interesting, Tim. Yeah, I think you may match some problem different from them because you know, you know, many Chinese students they like to follow you. Yeah, like uh, you are my supervisor. You must tell me what kind of things to do. But how can I get you know the degree? Yeah. Okay, Tim. An important Tien. part of our interview process as well to make sure that the student and postdoctoral candidates are motivated, you know, self motivated, so that they can come up with ideas and follow through. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You seem to have a little bit of a green tint, or quite a bit <laughs> of a green tint. 
the Midas <laughs> Square. I don't know if one, someone on the technical side might be able to correct right. that. Maybe it's our Martian broadcast for the beginning of 2021. <laughs> Right. So uh, currently in my group uh, is in China. So all the Chinese students, they are working very diligent and uh, they are smart. And uh, yeah, like Alice said, uh, I, I actually, when they come to my group, uh, I ask them again and again and again, are you interested in your uh, research project? So I, I will ask them to uh, attend the, the group meeting and to listen. They, they need to spend time to find their real interest and their, what they really like in, the, in this project. And also, uh, I will help them to, uh, uh, to get the more clear you know, goal or objective of his uh, research. I think it's very important because uh, for students, they, after uh, uh, his uh, uh, PhD graduation, he have to make a decision you know, will he stay in the academic field or go to the industry? So I think they're very important for them to uh, have a very clear career goal. You know, they have to know about uh, three or five years, what kind of person he will be and what kind of his uh, skill he will uh, learn and have. Uh, so I, 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 uh, uh, that's what I want them to uh, get from my uh, research group. Yeah, that's very interesting. Actually, I met the worst case is some students came to me. I asked them why you go to get a PhD. They say that my mom wants. Yeah, want me to be a PhD. I said, okay, what's in your mind? If you think you can get, you can go for a PhD, you have a talent or you have some dream. I say that okay, my mom. <laughs> That's the worst case. So we need to push more, uh, you know, hard on this to get the students thinking by themselves. Uh, I have some yeah. experience uh, to share is I think for the mentorship, the students in your group, the senior students, it's more helpful to help the junior one. Yeah, once they jump in the group, if you have some senior students, it's very good, it's excellent. They can, you know, do a lot of job, you know, help the junior one, you know, much better than the supervisors. Sometimes you say something, maybe they didn't follow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the senior students is really a good demo for them. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, th this was uh, some uh, uh, questions for the students. I have another question. It's for to nursing the young uh, scientists. Uh, so you all, all of you have uh, many student group uh, gr uh, graduated from your group, and later they became the you know uh, the young scientists in the field, and uh, some even because uh, became the superstars. So did you have any uh, kind of uh program to support them or any uh special support for these uh, uh you know group members to grow in and uh, to nursing them to be scientists who goes the first okay i'm happy to go first and so basically whenever the my students go to some place you know, whether they go to industry or otherwise go to government or otherwise they go to uh, you know, means, uh, to the academic institutions. And uh, I always tell them to choose something which they're passionate about and pursue that one sort of thing. Once they've got the passion and everything follows that sort of thing. So that generally that's what I always tell them to do. But I also tell them that sure, uh, I'm always there for you. So I always tell them that sure, uh, you know, your, your parents and your PhD supervisor Will always tell you, are, are always telling you what is good for you because they care about you, sort of thing. That's what I tell them. So in the process, what happens is that you know they keep in touch with me. In fact, whenever they are having problems, uh, that's the time they call me and then they wanted to have a chat, and then I end up calling them and then having a chat and then try to steer them in the right direction. But sometimes what happens is that when you think of the issues at hand, you start imagining that entire world is on your shoulders, sort of thing. So that's where you need to ask them to really not to think too much about these things and then try to, uh, you know, find, try to find a solution to the problem at hand. And that's where, in fact, I end up spending more time these days after they finish their PhD uh, and uh, interacting with them you know, on one thing or the other and applying for a, you know, uh, a grant and then being a referee or otherwise you know, write a reference for something or the other and then nominating for awards and all these sorts of things, you know. But again, that's again, for me, it's, I feel that it's, you know, it's my job to make sure 
that these people are you know, really achieving their dreams and goals. Our job as academics is to really help our students and postdocs and young scientists to really achieve their dreams and goals and enable, their, you know, enable that sort of thing. You know, that's our job. At least that's what makes me happy. <laughs> okay. Paul, how about you? Yeah, I see you have a silver student like Shirley. <laughs> I think an uh, academic research group is very much like having a family and fast forward, right? You get students or postdocs in and in, you know, depending upon their, uh, you know, what position, two to five years, uh, they're off into the world on their own and they never leave your family. It's just, they're no longer uh, living at home with you. And so we hear very frequently from our alumni, actually it's you know, 5.30 in the morning in Los Angeles, and I've already been interacting with two alumni from the group, and certainly more are to come uh, later in the day, and that's very typical. And so not only do I interact with alumni from the group, there are some very close uh, relationships uh, that form among students. For instance, one year I had five amazing women PhD students all join at the same time, and they're still coordinated uh, both personally and scientifically even though they're in different fields. So when they work on a paper, they pass the manuscript around uh, to the others and get feedback. When one has a baby or is sick, the others gather together and help. Wow. And so it really, there's a closeness uh, that comes from, from you know, being and working so closely together and, and supporting each other that I think lasts a lifetime. One of the most confusing things that ever happened along those lines is we went to an ACS meeting where it happened that the group from the time we started through current students and postdocs were all together. So we went yeah. out for an evening and there were people who had published papers together who had never met. So I was very excited <laughs> that you know, they would get to see each other and interact in real life. And I knew everybody, but it turned out they didn't know each other. And so very, uh, much to my dismay, the, the group alumni phase separated according to the years they were in the group and stayed amongst themselves rather than interacting across years. So I was left very confused and, and scratching my head, but uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was an interesting evening. Yeah, and but it should be a very lovely. See, I got to see so many former group members uh, at one time. <laughs> Okay, we're good, like a family. So tell how about Tim's family? <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, Paul and uh, uh, Professor Jagadish. I think that, uh, especially for Chinese, you know, uh, if you're in a research group, or uh, it really like a family. We have the special chemistry and also uh, the very unique bonding with each other. And uh, uh, not only the members in our group are, uh, also for the graduate the students and uh, all around the uh, uh, countries. And uh, we uh, care, uh, care about each other always. And uh, we take care, uh, also we learn from each other always. Yeah. How nice it is to meet the super, you know, wisers as this, yeah, to take as uh, everyone, as a family members, uh, help each other. and. Uh, I really appreciate that because my supervisor trained me like that. I met several, yeah, of all my mentors, of my uh, senior, you know, graduations from my peer, uh, my professors. But they all like my brothers, but though they are much older than me. We never met in the university, in the campus. But they all say, "Oh, we are in the same have family." Now everyone was in the WeChat group. Yeah, like uh, you know. Yeah, every week sharing some information is very good. I think as a PhD, uh, you know, in the group, everyone has these uh, similar feelings. And uh, this was also very helpful for the students grow up, for everyone, uh, you know, to uh, even in different field, even in different area, but uh, they keep this chain. Yeah, it's uh, like a family chain, it's like DNA. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so happy to have a panel discussion. Uh, uh, in the first week, we are so happy. I share so many informations. And I think now we can move to the second talk.